This is Our View, brought to you by the proud members of the Washington Federation of State Employees, the people who work for you. Once again, the Washington legislature, led by the Senate majority, did not finish its work on time and dragged out the budget portion of their task. Many articles have been written on the irresponsibility of this political tactic, but here are first-hand reports of the problems caused at the employee level, the people who deliver the services. The mood of the workers is horrible. You know, again, here at the hospital, it's no secret, we've had some challenges recently, and Everyone has really worked double, triple time, you know, really put in a lot of work to make a lot of great improvements, which we've made. And all of that is in danger of going away. We have historically had major problems with recruiting quality staff and retaining quality staff. And without a good budget, we're gonna lose the people that we got. They're gonna leave. They're gonna go to other jobs because people don't want to come to work every day and wonder, am I gonna have a job tomorrow? Am I gonna get paid tomorrow? And am I, am I gonna be able to pay my bills? We're not asking for unreasonable amounts of money. We're not asking to go drive Porsches. We're asking to be able to make enough of a wage that we can support our families doing very difficult work that we do. So as we're doing our normal jobs, watching our offenders, we have to worry about whether we're gonna have a job at the end of the day or if we're gonna get our pink slip and be sent home and then we have to worry about our coworkers that are left there with no one to back them. It's not okay. It's absolutely not okay. They just need to fund the budget and make things work. And uh, it, it impacts the whole community. It impacts the people that are doing the work and yet the politics are we're playing cat and mouse with each other but the people on the ground living the life and doing all the work that they re require are hurting, not knowing they're stressed out. We don't know if we get to go on our first family vacation or not. So I think the, one of the biggest effects is, as the state of Washington, we want to recruit and retain the best employees that we can. The jobs we do impact citizens of our state, whether they're in a state hospital, whether they're collecting services, um, whether they're on supervision, and to attract the best and brightest, we can't put people in the position where every two years they don't know if they're going to be laid off, they don't know if they're going to get a contract, they don't know if they're going to be paid reasonably. We don't go into public service to make a lot of money, but we do have families that we need to support. And to treat employees that way makes the choice, especially as the economy is getting better and people have more choices. They have the choice to work for the city if they're into this kind of work, the county, the federal government. And we are the only agency in the state of Washington right now that is doing this to employees consistently every two years. So if we want to retract, <laughs> attract, retain, and keep really talented people, we have to not treat them that way. And it's a terrible way to treat employees that are doing, interestingly, what the legislature has asked us to do. We implement the legislation that they pass, and they're not treating us like a partner. They're not treating us as valued employees. And state employees deserve better. The citizens of Washington deserve better. So we need to get out of the cycle, and we need to treat employees well and be an employer of choice. It, you know, you think you have a mental health problem in Washington State? You're adding to it. <laughs> you know, this is an incredible anxiety producing, stress inducing. It's just, it's incredible. I mean, I, what do they think their job is? What are they doing? Our producer recently asked AFL-CIO President Rich Trumpka what support the labor movement needs from the public employee unions. His answer should make public workers proud. Well, I, I think they have shown solidarity with all workers. Whenever we were fighting TPP, the public unions were at the forefront of that fight. They weren't in the background of that fight. Now they're being attacked, and it takes all of our solidarity, all of us standing together. I think what they do every day to make the country run uh, it should be uh, a, a showcase for us to be able to highlight them. Uh, because without public employees, the country, health care, pensions, everything, roads, transportation, everything would sort of come to a grinding halt. Uh, they are uh, the backbone of the economy. 
uh, and we need to continue to stand with them and make sure that that backbone grows uh, and doesn't get weakened. Philip Jennings, General Secretary of Global Union, is leading labor's need for international agreements in this volatile time of unpredictable technologies and economic uncertainty. This era has brought about corporations that seem to ignore present conventions and standards. I think what's important in this new digital age, we have a new digital actors. Digital actors who are trying to win market space and market opportunity by ignoring the regulations and by ignoring those labor standards. They behave as if those labor standards don't exist. And what we've had to do on the union side is to begin a, another discussion about what it means to be a worker and what the responsibilities of employers must be. We have international labor standards at the International Labor Office. We have the OECD uh, guidelines and, and other standards which are used to determine corporate behavior. Now the big six digital companies behave as if these standards don't apply to them. And then you get the case of Uber, who quite deliberately have a marketing strategy to bust regulation, to bust labor standards, and to try and undercut the competition. What unions have done is to begin a conversation about this abuse and the use of what they call, in a very kind of academic word, is regulation arbitrage. So the trade union movement went to the G20 labor ministers as we went to the European Union, as we gone to the International Labor Office and said, we are not going to tolerate this abuse of these standards on what it is to be a worker and how employers are trying to escape their responsibilities. Now, the G20 Labor Ministers have said that they have sympathy towards a much broader definition of what it is to be a worker and to stop the abuse of zero-hours contracts, stop the abuse of self-employed uh, status. And even in the European Union, in their social pillar, which is still work in progress, they have said that they want to redefine what it means to be a worker in the new digital context. So what does that mean? These standards are universal, they are global, they apply to you whether you're in a legacy industry or a, or, or a business that's been around a long time. They apply to Silicon Valley, they apply to Elon Musk, they apply to Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos, by the way, he wouldn't know what ILO Convention 87 and 98 looks like. And we have to change that business model. And that's what unions are doing. We're organizing, standing up for people, and trying to change their reality by ending the abuse that we see by these companies that think of themselves with glittering stars. But when it comes to their labor relations practices, they leave a hell of a lot to be desired. On this 100th anniversary of JFK's birth, we have a special treat for you. The season of university graduation speeches has just passed, and most are forgotten. But in 1963, President John F. Kennedy spoke to the graduates of Vanderbilt University and gave them a challenge, which is badly needed today. I speak to you today, therefore not of your rights as Americans, but of your responsibilities. They are many in number and different in nature. They do not rest with equal weight upon the shoulders of all. Equality of opportunity does not mean equality of responsibility. All Americans must be responsible citizens, but some must be more responsible than others by virtue of their public or their private position, their role in the family or community, their prospects for the future, or their legacy from the past. Increased responsibility goes with increased ability. For of those to whom much is given, much is required. You have responsibilities, in short, to use your talents for the benefit of the society which helped develop those talents. You must decide, as Goethe put it, whether you will be an anvil or a hammer, whether you will give to the world in which you were reared and educated the broadest possible benefits of that education, of the many special obligations incumbent upon an educated citizen, I would cite three as outstanding. Your obligation to the pursuit of learning, your obligation to serve the public, your obligation to uphold the law. If the pursuit of learning is not defended by the educated citizen, 
it will not be defended at all. For there will always be those who scoff at intellectuals, who cry out against research, who seek to limit our educational system. Modern cynics and skeptics see no more reason for landing a man on the moon, which we shall do, than the cynics and skeptics. We are the United State of Women. The United State of Women. The United State of Women. And when we do better, everyone does better. You with us? Then listen up. When we work, we get paid. The same as everyone else. Doing the same job. We will be the boss. Of a company. Of our company. Of a whole empire. Sounds good, right? We, 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 we are the United State of Women. Somos el Estado Unido de la Mujer. We are in charge of our own bodies. Every beautiful part. Every powerful part. Every which way we want to use them. It's our choice when to say yes and when to say no. Because duh. Literally duh. We're earning more college degrees than ever. We're coding like it's nobody's business. Doing whatever we want. Like it's nobody's business. Because we have ideas. Game-changing ideas. World-changing ideas. This is our movement. Turning struggle into strength. We're not done. We're definitely not done. So when we stand, stand with us. We are the United State of Women. The United State of Women. And we stand stronger when we stand together. Today, we'll change tomorrow. Together, we got this. We got this. This has been Our View. Brought to you by the members of the Washington Federation of State Employees. We remind you, when you accept a paycheck for your hard work, you don't give up your rights. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next month. But the educated citizen knows how much more there is to know. He knows that knowledge is power, more so today than ever before. He knows that only an educated and informed people will be a free people. That the ignorance of one voter in a democracy impairs the security of all. And that if we can, as Jefferson put it, enlighten the people generally, tyranny and the oppressions of mind and body will vanish like evil spirits at the dawn of day. And therefore, the educated citizen has a special obligation to encourage the pursuit of learning, to promote exploration of the unknown, to preserve the freedom of inquiry, to support the advancement of research, and to assist at every level of government the improvement of education for all Americans, from grade school to graduate school. Secondly, the educated citizen has an obligation to serve the public. He may be a precinct worker or president. He may give his talents at the courthouse, the state house, the White House. He may be a civil servant or a senator, a candidate or a campaign worker, a winner or a loser. But he must be a participant and not a spectator.